we've been in this collection of our series that we started, and this is week two. I'm talking about our theme for this year, which is enlarge, right? Do you still remember that? Yeah. Right? Last week, how many of you just uh, sung your lungs out? <laughs> right. I know, I know there are more people who sung who act than those who actually put your hands up. Uh, you know, but, but I believe last night, uh, last Sunday was, was, was really timely and beautiful to, to just see the church come alive in the truest form of, of worship. And I want us to go back to the scripture because this is something that we love doing. By now, if you have been journeying with us, you know that when it comes to the theme, we love going back to the core scripture for, for at least some amount of time until that becomes a part of your system. So let me ask you, has Isaiah 44 starting to become a part of your system? Sorry, what did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 54. <laughs> Listening. Now, that was not a trick question. That was a pure error on my side. Right? But is Isaiah 54 part of your system by now? Yeah, getting, there. getting there. Right. For some of you, if you're wondering what am I talking about, let's read Isaiah 54. Tonight, let's read the NIV version of it. All right? Isaiah 54. <clears throat> Verses 1 to 3. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song. Shout for joy, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. <clears throat> this is the promise that we have been Holding on to this is a promise that we have been speaking about, we have been praying, and, and over these last couple of weeks, this is something that we're going to be meditating on, at least for the next few weeks as we uh, go into this month. But I want to <clears throat> read verse 2 again, and this is where we're going to be parking ourselves. Last week, we, we were talking about the phrase of sing and shout for joy or burst out into singing. Tonight, I want us to park on verse 2, which says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Let's pray as we dive in. God, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We want to thank you, Lord, for the scripture and all that we're about to dive in, Lord, I pray for the spirit of revelation, Lord. I pray, God, that let your truth prevail. Let the truth of the scripture minister to every heart in this place. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. There's some phrases in these three verses that we have been, we have been reading. And... Uh, I can't help but, but focus on some of these phrases uh, that, that have been there and this, how, this, how this promise is a beautiful blueprint that uh, the prophet Isaiah has captured for, for God's people when it comes to each one of us experiencing growth, each one of us experiencing whether it's multiplication or increase in the kingdom of God. Now, I know each one of us will have subjective uh, uh, ways to express ourselves when it comes to these words that I spoke about, whether it's growth, whether it's multiplication, it's increase. And in, in case if you missed out of uh, the, the true intention of Isaiah 54 that we spoke about a couple of weeks, this is a promise for the global church, by the way. This is a promise that has been given and, and that is in, the, in its outworking for the global church. And, and I believe we are a part of that, Right? And so that means this is a promise for you and I, not just, not just in 2024, but I believe every single day and every single year, we're going to see some of this come alive as we pursue Christ. And tonight I want to talk to you on, on something that I've 
titled Tenets of, for Enlargement. The two tenets that I want to I wanted to highlight, the two principles or two core scriptures or two uh, core themes, not scriptures, core themes that the, the prophet Isaiah is talking about. And he uses in, in this word in verse 2, you would, you'd see this word, uh, from, especially from the version that we just read. The first one is a word lenden and the second one is a word called strengthen. It's like almost rhyming. It's called lenden and strengthen, you know. And, and I want us to talk for the next few minutes today um, on, these, on these two principles. So when we're talking, when the prophet is writing to us, or, or today when we look at the scripture in the context of the church of Jesus Christ, when we talk about lengthening, we, we get an idea of the idea to spread out, to, to expand, right? That's, that's what something that you would see if you go back and read some of the studies that have been done on Isaiah 54. You would see that it, it, the, the basic idea is the idea to spread out. And strengthening is the idea of going deep and staying firm. Let me say going deep and staying firm. And so you see that the core idea that has been expressed in, in, in these phrases of lengthen and strengthen is the first idea is to expand or to go wide. And the second idea is to go deep, right? I don't know if you grew up in, in kids' church uh, learning the song. Okay. Any, uh, I don't know if you... Okay, God's love is so wonderful. But I don't know if you heard this song. I learned it uh, not in my kids' church, uh, but I learned it when I became an adult and I had gone to Shillong and they started singing this song. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Do you know the song? A few people. Okay. Deep. And, and, and I couldn't help but that, that, that hook just stuck in my, in my head, right? So this is something that I heard about at least 10 plus years ago. And I can't help but if you want to remember Isaiah 4, 54, in this context, I want to tell you these two words, these two phrases, lend and strengthen, deep and wide, whatever helps you remind yourself of that, I want you to take note of this phrase because the, the, the fulfillment or the, or the fullest expression of enlargement is captured in these two things. Now, I know that we are talking about how this promise is applicable for the church of Jesus Christ. So the first way, when you're talking about lending, the idea of spreading out, we, we are talking about evangelism. Somebody say evangelism. evangelism. And when you're talking about strengthening, the idea of going deep and staying firm, this is no-brainer, no church. Come on, this is discipleship, right? If you see the, the whole kingdom of God that Jesus the apostles, the disciples, the, the churches, great revivalists, mission folks. You know, people have done great works in, in, in different parts of, of the earth, you know, to expand and increase the kingdom of God. You would see that both of this, these big themes have been at play. People have owned up the call for evangelism. People have owned up the call for discipleship. And, and for the kingdom of God to invade our spaces, we need to see healthy rhythms of evangelism and discipleship. It cannot be one over the other. It needs to be both. Somebody say it needs to be both. It cannot just be about let's just continue to reach out. And not really ground ourselves in the truth of the scripture. Yet on the other side, it cannot be just, I want to grow strong and I want to become mature in Jesus. How many of you have said those phrases? Right? Nothing wrong with that. But true maturity is experienced when you extend your love to someone else who does not know about the love that you have experienced. True maturity, the, the, the truest form of maturity, that's why you see the disciples, they could have been super content that they found Christ. And they could have kept it to, us, to themselves. Right? Or, or not just the twelve, but the, but the ones who were in the upper room, they could have been super content that they had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and they could have kept it to themselves. But somehow, I think... It, 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 I don't know what or how or why this happens, but somehow in today's time and age, there's a, there's a, there's a tendency in the church to 
gravitate towards one over the other. But may I present to you that if you want to see true, or if you want to experience true enlargement happen in your life, you need to train uh, yourself to really have a holistic meaning of evangelism and a holistic revelation of, of discipleship. Holistic revelation of evangelism and of discipleship. And I want to say this one, once again, it's not one over the other. It's not one over the other. And, and just for tonight's context, allow me to kind of take us back to some of the roots of, of how biblical evangelism had been, has been established and has been prevailing all through cultures, all through different seasons, different times, uh, and, and different mindsets of people. You know, all through that time, the, the, the core part of the gospel has been extended. And evangelism comes, this word comes from this Greek word, evangelion, which means good news or the gospel. Now, some of you might know this. Some of you might, might have a fair amount of understanding of the root of this word. But I say this to some of you to really understand that sometimes we pick our definitions from the culture. And I'm talking about we pick our definitions from Christian culture. Do you know something like that exists? There are many, there's, there's a lot of content on social spaces that talk about Christian culture, right? And, and sometimes we pick our definitions of evangelism, of missions, and everything from, from what's being thrown at us in the, in the digital space. Or what's been thrown at us through conferences and, and workshops and things like that. But I, I want to probe some of us, including myself tonight, that what is the gospel that we are called to believe in? What is... The gospel that we are called to believe in. Why is it important that all disciples of Jesus understand the whole truth of the gospel? And why is it important that disciples of Jesus not just believe in the gospel, but become, somebody say become, messengers of the gospel? Do these questions matter to us, church? If you, if you missed out, I want, to, I want to repeat because this is really the crux of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Why, what is the gospel that we are called to believe in? Do you know that? Why is it important that all disciples understand the whole truth of the gospel? And why is it important that all disciples not just believe in the gospel, but become messengers of the gospel? To really unpack these three questions, I wanted to give you stories, I wanted to give you real life experiences, but then I realized, again, I'm going to introduce you to, I'm going to introduce you to a way of learning, which is nothing, that, nothing that's wrong with it, but let's for a moment flip it, and let's go back to the core of how scripture answers these three questions for us. Now, if, you, if you're somebody who, who has been reading the, the writings of the New Testament, you'll see that Romans captures this idea in, in chapter 3 and, and verses 23 to 26. Paul writes this, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice of sin. And people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. He makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Not when they do just works, but when they what? Are you guys okay? Just checking. 
And some of you are like, oh, man, if I just have to believe, what do I do with my good works? Do I just pack it up and like put it out in the bag? Let's face it, this challenges every bit of self-effort that you have been putting in to growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You guys are giving me faces as if we just read something in Greek, not in English. Uh, but what we just heard is a part as to Paul trying to answer what the gospel is. In fact, he goes on to stress on it. Let's, let's see, when he's writing another letter, he, he, he's writing to the church in Corinth, and 1 Corinthians captures a beautiful idea of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll read from verses 2 to 4. It is this good news that saves you. And if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead and on the third day just on, uh, he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said now some of you are like nanad i know this man like why are we going to the basics of evangelism and the gospel we live like we fully understand the gospel but yet there's so much in us that stalls us from fully living out the gospel we were never meant to just understand the gospel church. We are called to, somebody say this with me, live out. Live out the gospel. For far too long, we have been patting ourselves on the back saying that I understand the gospel. For far too long, some of us have this notion and this thinking that I can articulate the gospel better. But let me tell you something, articulating the gospel is slightly different from living out the gospel. And what Paul is really drawing you and I to is to answer this question for yourself. Do we really live out the gospel? And to live out the gospel, it's important that we first understand the gospel. So I'm, I've got nothing against you taking the effort to understand this gospel of grace. But far too long, we spend our life and we spend the most amount of our time and seasons of our life in understanding the gospel that there's never a moment to live out or, or express the gospel to ourselves. And when it comes to evangelism, if you want to experience the, the first part of, of enlargement in your life. If you, if you really believe that this is a promise that God has given this church and God has given, this, given you as a part of the church, I want, you to, and I want you and me to know that we cannot live as if we fully understand the gospel and, do, and just be okay with that. We need to have something in us, that the conviction in us to really go out there and see how we can continue to reflect Christ, which is a reflection of the gospel. And I'll, and I'll show you what I mean by that. The, that the, there's a beauty, and, and there's, a, there's a beauty to the gospel. There's a power of the gospel as well. And when those both come together, and when it's impacting your lives, that's where we see it coming out. So let me ask you this very simple question. It's not a trick question, church. How many of you have been impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah? Is that you? Right? I had a teacher of mine in school. And she used to, you know, really uh, call out if we had this habit of just putting our hands half up or something, you know. She's like, hey, you, man. Like, you know how, Rico, you know how Anglo speak, right? <laughs> hey, you, man. Either put your hands up or put them down. I don't understand this. So I'm not that teacher, 
but I'm just putting that in as I speak. So let me ask this once again. How many of you have been impacted by the gospel? Okay, come on, of Jesus Christ. I don't know why we always have to come back and, and like, you know, practice humility in this setting. Now, if you really believe that you are that person who has, who has been impacted, transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, let me ask you, has most of your journey being, been about understanding the gospel or making people health, know and experience the gospel? Where do you lean in the most? I'm not trying to attack your journey of understanding the gospel. But I am trying to attack the comfort that we start experiencing in our journey of understanding the gospel. Have you become so comfortable in understanding the gospel that there is no discomfort in us to help go out there and model the gospel of Jesus to the people around us? And, and I say this because when we fall back to the core of the scripture, we see the disciples of Jesus do something extraordinary yet in the most simple manner. And I want to share with you one of the stories from the scripture, from the book of Acts. You know, there was a time where there, there were these seven people who were chosen to serve. And Philip was one of the seven that was chosen in the book of Acts. And, and they, they, when, they, when they chose them, when the apostles and the, and the early apostles chose them, they said that they, they kind of selected people who was, what? Full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And, and they're the ones who were appointed with the call to go out there and preach. And I want to show one of the beautiful things that can happen if the church learns to embody the gospel to those around them. Let's read from Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to Eight. Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 8. It's up on the screen. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. So out of the seven, Stephen was killed, he was martyred. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and butted Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the, somebody say, but... The believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. I love verse 6 and, and how Luke goes into the depths of it. He says what? Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. But I want you to read this verse 8 with me as loud and as strong as possible. So there was great joy in the city. I don't know if some of you have caught this verse. It doesn't say so there was rejoicing or celebration. Luke tells us, and, uh, tells us something very specific. So there was great joy in that city. Sometimes our obedience to the gospel and the great commission can release a blessing to those around you beyond your human comprehension. This, this, this story of Philip going to Samaria and being with the people in the city, not just healing them, not just causing them to, to talk to them about the Messiah and, and about Christ, but it tells you and me that there was great joy in the city. And, and I got hooked to that. 
I really got hooked to that. I could not, I could not move away from that one phrase because when was the last time you saw this come alive around you? Let me tell you, God desires for this still to happen in today's time and age in our setting, church, by the way. And, and living by the gospel may not assure you of life's pleasures and happiness, but it does assure you of joy. It does assure you of joy. And, and far too long, you know, when, when, when we understand the journey of knowing about Christ, knowing about the gospel, knowing about what he, who he is and what he did. So much of our focus is on that. But I want to tell you, Philip did something that was simple. Philip did something that was yet extraordinary. To see the lame heal, to see, to see the paralyzed walk and everything. That is the manifestation of the power of God. And let me tell you, the church of Jesus Christ still sees that happen in today's time and age. Science, wonders, and miracles are a part of the gospel, church. Science, wonders, and miracles is not something that has ceased to happen. God is still working his miracles in our midst. God is still changing lives in our midst. God is still healing people in our midst. And we need to come to the truth, uh, to the terms of the truth that he has laid on, on, on the church. And what I want to show you, Philip preached Christ to that city. Philip preached Christ to that city. His assignment, somebody say his assignment, <laughs> was to preach Christ. Somebody say, my assignment <laughs> is to preach Christ. Do you believe in what you just said? Your assignment, my assignment is to preach Christ. And some of you are like, no, 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 I don't like to preach. Okay. Let me, let me tell you in a way that we will understand. Somebody say, my assignment, my assignment. is to reflect Christ. <laughs> is that okay? Yes. Ah, preaching? Nahi? Oh, okay, okay. Okay. But each one of us has been called to reflect Christ through everything that we say and through everything that we do. And so Philip, when he's going out on this assignment to the city of Samaria, he is staying true to the identity that Jesus has given him. He's staying true to the identity that Christ has spoken over him. He's staying true to the anointing that has been given to him by the laying on of hands by the apostles and, and the people or, or the early disciples and apostles. And under the leading of the Holy Spirit and under the authority of God, Philip is able to do all that we just read. And so Philip goes there, he preaches the Christ. His assignment, like I said, was to preach Christ. He goes out there, he preaches the Christ of Nazareth. He preaches Jesus, the one who was born fully human, yet fully God. He preaches the one who took the sins upon himself and he died. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. He preached about the Christ who, was, who turned everything upside down. When there was a time where people were being forced to practice the law, Jesus comes and disrupts the practice of the law so that they can practice the truth and the fulfillment of the law through Christ Jesus. And then he, he, Philip uses all of this, I'm guessing, when he spoke about, he told them about the Messiah. He told them about the one who defeated the death and called us to live so that we may have life and eternal life as an assurance for us. And he preaches Christ to them. He preached Christ in whom we find meaning. He preached Christ in whom we find our purpose in life. And this is the Christ that Philip spoke to the people in Samaria. You know, sometimes we can, we can get caught up in talking to the people around us about things they really don't need to know sometimes. Yeah, I know the wrath of God is real. Do you really want to start your conversation about evangelism with somebody about with the wrath of God? And hell and judgment. Turn or burn, my friend. The time is coming. Now please don't misunderstanding, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong in those words. 
It sounds right. Maybe it is right. But do you really want to start a conversation in that way? Imagine if somebody would have started the conversation with you in that way. Maybe somebody did and you got scarred and yet you, yet you are here. And that is a testament of the grace of God. Amen. You know? <laughs> but, but come on. Can we agree that we, our assignment is to preach? Oh my goodness. I just spoke to you five minutes ago. <laughs> our assignment is to preach Christ. I changed it and I, and I spoke it in an easy way. I said our assignment is to reflect Christ. Do you remember that now? Yeah. Okay, just checking. Thank you. Our assignment, church, is to preach Christ to the people, to reflect Jesus to the people around us. And sometimes the best way for people to see the Christ that you believe in is they'll see it when they, when they don't just hear it from your words, they'll see it when they see it through your life. They will see it through your life convictions, not just what you blabber with your mouth. Not just with how well you can speak with your mouth. They will see it through how you live your life. What are some of the convictions that you hold on to? They will see Christ through that. They will see Jesus through the way you conduct yourselves without saying those words that I love Jesus. And Philip... His assignment was to preach Christ. I was, I was reading one of the expositions by this famous uh, preacher called Charles Spurgeon. If you love to read about his writings and all that he's, he's done and the way God used him. There's a quote that I want to show for, uh, of Charles Spurgeon. He says, Beloved friends, I delight to preach to you all the doctrines which are found in God's word. But I desire... Always to preach the person of Christ above the doctrine. The doctrine is but the chair in which Christ sits as a prophet to instruct us. Somebody say to yourself, preach Christ. Christ. Reflect Christ. Is that okay? Is that okay? You want us to be, we, if we have to be a community that is driven, where evangelism is on the forefront of things, we are losing the conversation before we even begin the conversation. If you start on, you want to present the right doctrine to the person. Christ and the Holy Spirit will take care of that conviction about the right doctrine and the perfect doctrine that that person needs to follow. Your assignment is to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Is that true? I'm not making this up. It's there in your Bibles if you read Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will be my... Come on, say the word. Witnesses. witnesses. You will be my witnesses. What, what does a witness do? He, just, he or she just tells what they have seen, experienced, or heard. The judge doesn't need anything more than you, more from you apart from that. You've told, okay, bro, your job is done. Now I'll take it over from there. And that's why if you see that the, the, the communities that are flourishing, the churches that are flourishing, you'll see that there's a there's a... There's absolute heavy demand that the gospel places on each and every disciple where evangelism is not one of the things that we do. Evangelism is one of the main things that we are ought to do. And today I'm talking about evangelism. Next Sunday when we meet, we'll be talking about discipleship. So don't, 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 misunderstanding, don't misunderstand me when I say we're talking about one over the other. We'll be talking about both. Because both of these are going to help us experience truest form of enlargement as a church. And I want to tell you, you know, as, as, as Philip did it in Samaria, can I tell you something? When you start this journey of sharing the gospel, there's a part of, part of it, I don't know if everybody experiences it. Uh, maybe you're, 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 you're too self-aware or maybe you, you're really good at practicing grace and practicing your identity. But a part of me had this struggle, you know, I thought I started taking the ownership on myself, you know. I started taking the ownership on myself to see I can do it. I can do it. But let me tell you, there's somebody who's already gone ahead and done the work that Jesus wants you to complete. 
What is that? What is that scripture? Somebody planted. Somebody watered. Somebody else harvested. Remember that? So can we not fool ourselves that you and I are the first touch points of the gospel in someone else's life? Maybe we are, but can I say most of the time, God is already at work in that person's life before he places you in their life. And so all that you and I need to be willing to do is that God teach me to play my role better. You know who had already begun the work in Samaria? Jesus. When he met the woman at the well. Where was that? That was in a town called Sychar in where? In Samaria. So Jesus had become the forerunner in sharing the good news of the gospel with the people of Samaria. And after a few years, God would create an opportunity for Philip to go back to Samaria and teach and, and preach and, and do signs, wonders and miracles for the message that Jesus Christ had already pioneered for the town of Samaria. And so every single time with the ownership and the call that we respond to in sharing the gospel, I want you to know that God is already at work within those people in your life, around your life. And maybe God just wants you and me to fulfill our part. Not every conversation will be a place where, you know, you take them from, you know, from them not knowing about Jesus to them getting baptized and them getting, becoming a disciple and serving in the church. Not all conversations in our life have to be that way. You, are, you and I will stereotype the gospel if we take the ownership on ourselves to create a pathway for people, which is your pathway and my pathway rather than the pathway that God has laid out for them. But I know one thing for sure that when we own up to the call of sharing the message of the gospel, when we own up to play your part and my part about taking people from point A to point B, and then somebody else might come in their life to take them from that point somewhere further. All that I'm requesting you is that don't come in their life and take them on the other extreme. We're supposed to move them from minus 10 to 0 and then to plus 10. Let's not be the people who take, who take them other way around. But I know one thing, church. God desires that every disciple plays their part in helping someone close, come close to knowing Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to tell you about the story about this person. I told you, right, someone else is already working behind the scenes. Somebody else has already gone ahead and labored before something like this came into being. I believe, you know, it's not God depositing this thought in our minds about, you know, starting a church in Vimanagar and starting a church in Baner. Yes, we get to, yes, we get to do it in person. But I believe there are people who have already gone before us and who have prayed and who have labored and who have desired for those things to happen way before the thought was deposited in my heart. So I don't want to be the one saying that, you know, we are the only ones who are able to do this. Because there are many more people that God is compassionate and, and really willing to use if you and I don't buck up and, and do what we are supposed to do. The gospel advances at the pace of relationships. I always believe, I'm a firm believer of that statement, that ministry works best at the pace of relationships. And you and I have been given this gift of building relationships with people, but for what sake? Why are you building relationships? Why are you getting to know the person you're getting to know? Yes, you want to, you want to gain their trust. Yes, they want to gain your trust. Yes, you want to do life together. You want to create memories together. But can I challenge some of you that beyond creating memories, beyond creating those trips and those, those experiences that you are already doing so well, maybe, just maybe, God has brought you in their lives so that you can take that person a step closer or maybe a few steps closer to knowing Christ and that Christ will set them free. That Christ will really help them know their true meaning and their true purpose in life. But if we spend all our energy and all our time in just understanding the gospel, we are robbing ourselves of opportunities where we get to reflect the gospel. 
And so that's why even in this space of evangelism and, and kind of living out the gospel, we need, to do, we need to be doing both. And so I want to talk to you about this, about this person called Ramchandra Deshpande. I don't know how many of you even know this name. He was an Orthodox Brahmin from Nagpur district. He was born in the early, uh, in the late 1800s. He was a staunch Hindu. And as a child, in fact, he had great resentment towards Christianity. He, he was against some of the, some of the practices of, of Christian uh, living. And some of the prominent persons were kind of, you know, fueled that, that, that thought about Hinduism as well. And so he joins a college in Nagpur. And he wanted to leave that college because of the fear that he would have to learn more about the Bible and embrace Christianity for his life. And if he continued his education in that college, that was his fear. However, something flipped in his life and he started to become deeply influenced by the scripture. And he started reading the scripture for himself. And he was, as he, as he was strongly opposed to the idea of becoming a Christ follower, lo and behold, one day he decided to give his life to Jesus Christ. And while that was happening, he, he shifted his base from Nagpur to Pune in 1917. And he never left the city of Pune. He never left the city of Pune. He, in fact, joined one of the churches in the city and he dedicated his life to the teachings of Christ and he did a lot of social service for the poor and the needy. But here's something that he observed. When he moved to the city of Pune, he saw that the people who practiced Christian faith were not, very few of them were the locals. Most of the people who were practicing Christian faith were, were people from, say, from the Portuguese. They were the Goans. They were the Tamilians. They were, they were the people from Kerala. Come on, where the Malu's at? <laughs> Woo! And, and, and he saw that he was not, he could not find local people of the land who were able to live out and express their faith. And, the, and so there was a divide that was there between, the, between those who called themselves Christ followers and the local people of the land. And so while he saw that, it is, it is Deshpande who became a link between the local population and him making Christ known to the local people. A Brahmin who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior became a medium for the locals to experience Christ in their culture. What, what, I, what, what fascinates me is that here's a, here's a Brahmin who fully acknowledged the ways of the scripture. A lot of people, some of you know, know these areas, some of you might be new to this, but I want to still go ahead and say this. A lot of people in the area of Nana Pet and Bhavani Pet, Korpadi Pet, Mangalwar Pet, became Christ followers thanks to this person called Brother Deshpande. Local people. Local people who experience Christ and, and the message of faith. God used his life to reduce the division and the gap that had been created between those who were practicing faith versus the locals who needed to hear the truth of the gospel. And he was so affectionate that today some of you would have heard the name of the church if you have heard this church called BDM or Brother Deshpande Memorial. This church has been established based on the works that he had done. This is a heritage site in our city. But, you know, for, for the work that this guy had done in the local land. I, I share this story with you, church. Just to tell you that Philip repeated what Christ began in Sychar, Samaria. He went there. He, he, he stayed there. He, he preached Christ. He continued to tell them about the message of the gospel through signs, wonders, and miracles, and there was great joy in the city. In the early 1900s, there was this brother, Desh Pandey, who left his comfort of his city, came to the city of Pune, reduce the gap for people around him to really model Christ and the gospel to those so that the locals and the people of this city could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
not just through words but through his works he he's if you read about him he's done a lot of social work he he helped the downtrodden he helped the he helped the people of low caste and and even in the brahmin community people really respected him not just for the work he did but for the faith he had in christ i tell you this story to tell you to help us understand that i hope we are not giving in to the geo political scenarios that are being created in our land to tell us that the message of the gospel has gone weak when you and i learn to embody christ according to the scriptures every single one wants to know what you have on the inside of you every single body wants to connect and and get to know you and why you live the way you live why you believe the way you believe why do you things why do you do things the way you do things because you and i are really holding on to the truth of scripture and what philip did was a repetition of of what christ did in sikar what you and i get to do is a repetition of what brother deshpande did in the early 1900s and you and i get to replicate that the same age old timeless message of the gospel which can still transform lives and save people and really see healings signs and wonders so that the person of jesus christ can be made manifest through your stories through your stories And so I know this is not the first time you're hearing about evangelism. I know some of you know this too well, but can I nudge you and tell you it's not just about knowing it too well. It's about putting it into practice. It's to really see God, can you show me those people where I need to play my part? That's a low hanging fruit right there to start with. show me those people that i where i can really model christ for them show me those people in my life where i can really continue to model the gospel that has been impacting me in my life so that i can continue to be a witness for the sake of your kingdom thank you for tuning in for that message we really hope that that has blessed your heart immensely at zealous it's our desire that jesus would meet you at the point of your need and that you would truly grow in the love and the grace that he has to offer each one of us and that's why if you have been enjoying the content that has been coming to you i want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel to share this content with your friends and your loved ones and maybe even consider partnering with us as we take the message of the gospel beyond the four walls of zealous once again it means so much for us when you join in So thank you for being here with us. God bless you and may you have a great week ahead.